Today's episode is all about how to stop rambling and get to the point. I am coming to you live today from my car. Curious, how do you think the audio sounds? It actually seems to be quite good, in fact. But if we think about it, I always like to start with, are you a rambler? Because I am a recovering rambler myself. And the tendency to ramble is something that is so common. And it's one of the biggest obstacles also to presenting well. And so how do we get past that? I want to remind us that when we ramble, we can come across as unfocused. And that is not clear, compelling, and credible communication. And I know that's why you're all here. So we want to look at being as clear as possible from the beginning and then looking at, okay, well, how do I then handle when I do end up rambling? So I know that you know I'm a cut to the chase kind of person. I want to jump in and give you a tip right away on rambling. I also want to give you some tips around how do we actually get there and then what are some of the factors that we need to consider. So first of all, if you notice yourself rambling, stop, pause to gather your thoughts and say out loud, my point is this. That will not only help you, but it will help the people around you focus and go, oh, okay, great. She has a point here. And that right away is going to be a fabulous way to help you to recover in particular. Now, obviously, we want to make sure that we get to that point up front very quickly and not bury the lead of our story or bury the point. Because as Donald Miller sell, says, if you confuse, you lose. If we are confusing, if we give too much context up front, it's going to lose the point. Usually, in my experience with people, now having coached thousands of people, when somebody does not get to the point within a minute of speaking, people tend to tune out. I see it all the time. I time people. I see it. And it is incredible how often we don't even realize that we are rambling sometimes. And I also want to say it doesn't mean that you're always rambling in a, like, in you sound incoherent or something, there are also times when we go off on a tangent, but do we have the emotional intelligence to be attuned to knowing, am I actually on a trajectory here that's going to bring it back to the point? Am I on a tangent that's going to be relevant to bring it back to the point? Or am I all over the place and I'm not even sure where I'm headed? So there's a very different feel of how that comes across as well. So I've seen plenty of people do well with tangents and then bringing them back home. But especially for the beginning of our talk, we want to be crystal clear up front. What in the world are we trying to say? And you don't want somebody in the audience wondering, what is she trying to say? Because that's not going to bode well for your leadership as well as your credibility and authority. So first thing that I would suggest when you prep is ask yourself, what is the main thing that I want to get across? And you state that very quickly up front. But too often what happens, and I want to give you an example of somebody that I was working with in it before I started working with her, what she told me. But here's the thing. You can probably relate to this. A data dump of information where we give all this data or just all types of information that's not very helpful and even worse, we tend to project that onto a document or we take an Excel document and we project that onto a PowerPoint slide and expect people to read through it and determine what's more important. If you have 10 numbers, let's just say 10 line items with numbers on a spreadsheet and you don't translate that for people, they're going to come to their own conclusions. So wouldn't you rather get them to get on board with what your point is, explain why the data is relevant and what matters. So that's our job as storytellers and as communicators is to take the data and translate it in a well-meaning story or example that people can grasp onto. For example, I was coaching a senior VP in compliance. She's actually part of the powerhouse program that I have, my mastermind. And when she first started with me, I remember asking her about this presentation. I said, well, tell me about what you're going to say or how would you start it off? Well, she started by data dumping. And I said, hold on, let's take a step back. What 
is the reason that you're telling me all this information. And then she said, oh, well, the main point is that I want to give them an update that we are 3% above this quarter where we were last. And I said, oh my gosh, say that first. That's the lead of your story. So that was such a good example of what many people do. We just give, start giving all this information because we forget that our audience doesn't know as much as we do. We make lots of assumptions and jump to conclusions, which is a natural thing that we do as human beings, of course. Makes total sense. And yet, if we want to be influential, we want to make sure that we get to that point quickly and we share that meaningful story or example. And so instead, she did such a beautiful job. She started by saying something like this. And I'm going to read this because this is a direct quote from the example. We began with practicing a presentation. As I hit record, she launched into the information with no real context or direction, as I know I already said. Instead of saying, here are the numbers we'll be going over, which is purely informational, say instead, and here's what she did say, we had significant revenue growth in Q3 over Q2. In fact, it was a 3% difference. Notice how the second one offers a point of view that gives the talk direction. So you always want to make sure when you are speaking that you're giving your talk or what you're saying direction. The curse of knowledge happens all the time. This is when we are so expert in what we know that we forget to see things through the lens of other people. We tend to launch into our talks or the things that we're saying without remembering this. And the problem is we don't even realize it. And our job is, as I mentioned before, to translate the knowledge in our heads to the audience in a way that's understandable, that's relatable, and also more memorable. I remember this very well when I had a physical injury in my foot. If you've ever had a physical injury, you've gone to the doctor. For me, it was in my ankle. And I asked the doctor what, because he kept talking about the calcaneus. And I'm thinking, what is he talking about? And finally, I said, what is the calcaneus? And he said, oh, it's your heel bone. <laughs> As if I should know that. Like, duh. And I thought, well, this is a great example of the curse of knowledge. If he had explained that the calcaneus is the heel bone from the beginning, I would have been able to understand what he was saying much better, or at least have some context for that. So the, the thing is, most of us truly are so focused on getting whatever we're trying to say right that we forget about other people not knowing as much as we do. So we make assumptions. And the thing that I want to share is that I used to be a leadership consultant at The Gap and going back to people are simply trying to prove themselves. It has helped me give people a lot more compassion when I understood this one thing that I learned. There is a book called The Knowing Doing Gap. No pun intended here with the gap. And in the book, these researchers, Pfeffer and Sutton out of Stanford University, wanted to find out why is it that we know we're supposed to do certain things, but we don't always do it? Like, why do we skew data when we know it's not 100% accurate? Or on a, a very just everyday example, why do we not floss our teeth every day when we know that is healthier for us? Well, what they came up with, which I found fascinating, is that above all else, human beings are committed to these three things, looking good, being right, and being in control. Looking good, being right, and being in control. And when you know that about people, it number one, it can help us have a lot more compassion for people. Now, in this context, I'm bringing it up because most of us are trying to prove ourselves, and that's why we give so much data we want to look good. We want to put all that information out there. And the problem is that when we're trying to prove ourselves and we overcome over, what am I saying? Over complex things. That's not even the right phrase. Anyway, we over complicate things. Then it is not as palatable for our audience. And then we don't, in the end, look as good because we look like we can't communicate. So it's funny how it ends up kind of uh, hitting us in the foot. All right, let's focus on not convincing people to do things, but inviting people in because what we don't need is more content. What we need is simplicity. And if we can focus instead of fumble, that will also help us to come across in a much better way. So I like to say, be brief, 
be bright, be done. Get to the point and move on. As I also love to say, land the plane. So there was also an interesting example that were about two different people. So basically about tuning people out. So I was on two different calls recently where there were people sharing information. And in both cases, it was more detail than I needed. And frankly, I started to tune out. And the one that actually started with the point, it went, oh, I went, oh, okay, great. And the other person that was just rambling and probably didn't even realize she was rambling, I, I had a harder time staying focused. So what ended up happening is I had to ask her more questions to help her get to the point, which would help me then take in that information. One of the other things I talked about a little bit earlier is bottom line up front. BLUF is the abbreviation for that, bluff. It's a U.S. military term that is often used specifically around exactly what it talks about. Bottom line up front, in your emails, in your communication, what is the bottom line? When you state that first, then we know that, oh, there's more details coming if I want to listen further or if I want to read further if it's an email. But oftentimes what happens, our human tendency is to share all of the detail and then get to the point at the end of what we're saying or at the end of an email. And the problem is, sadly, most people won't stay around long enough to get to the end of that. That's why putting this up front makes such a difference. Think about the last five emails that you read or wrote. What are the last five? What were the subject lines that you had in there? And if you can go back and look at those and ask yourself, are my subject lines worth reading. In other words, will somebody look at your subject line compared to all of the other emails that they're looking at as they're scrolling through on their phone and say, oh, I want to read that one. I get what the point is. Whenever there are unclear points in an, in emails, most of us say, oh, I'll read that later. So this is why it's really, really important. And one of the things that I would say here is how, well, I have an, I have an example for you a story of a woman that I was coaching on interviewing skills. And she said, well, first I asked her the typical question. Hey, tell me about yourself. Let's do a mock interview. So she told me about herself in way too much detail. I paused, stopped and said, okay, first of all, that's a little, I, like basically I can read that from your resume, a little bit too much information. So if you go back and think about what the job is, how you're qualified, what is the most important thing to tell that interviewer or hiring manager right up front that will help give context for the you being a candidate, basically? And so she thought about it and she said, well, I love research and that's really important in this job and that's why I'm applying. So I said, start with that. We did a second interview, mock, and I asked her the same question. Tell me about yourself. Right away, she said, well, before I go into any detail, I know you can read that on my resume. What's most important is for you to know that I love research and that is exactly what I what you're looking for in the job. You don't want to say, I started to say, I believe. So I caught myself. You don't want to say, that's what I believe you're looking for. Say, according to the job, according to the job posting, that's what you're looking for. And that's where my passion as well as my expertise is. And that's the most important thing I want to get across to you today. I'll share a couple of other tidbits to give you a better breadth of my experience, but I definitely wanted to share that up front. So that was such a different experience when she said that up front. It was so much better. And by the way, for those of you that are interested in considering working with me, if you want to land that job of your dreams, if you want to get promoted, if you want to ask for that raise and you're not exactly sure how, or you want to be a better public speaker or presenter at work so that you can advance and move up. I have this group that's wonderful called The Powerhouse. We meet twice a month, and that also includes individual coaching as well. So you can really, really jump into where you want to go. And the group is incredibly supportive. If you're interested in that, book a clarity call with me. There is a link to that here, or you can go onto my website. And it's just a 15 quick call 15 minute quick call where we can talk about whether it makes sense to work together. 
but I would love to help you get more clarity in moving forward, whether you would decide to work with me or somebody else. Here's another example that was really powerful. I was coaching a construction firm on their sales pitch and they launched right in with beautiful slides that looked wonderful, but here was their problem. It was all about themselves. And what do people care about? We care about ourselves. So I make that point because the people giving the pitch were so focused on proving themselves and giving this great, great pitch of all the places that they've worked and all the things they've designed. But the problem was they led with that. And we've got to remember our audience that's sitting there or standing there when we're in communication with them. What do they care about? That's what matters. It's not about what we care about. It's what's going to make them buy in. What's going to influence them to sign off on our idea or our product or our service? Well, I had them redo that deck. I said, the problem is, we well, not the problem, the human nature thing is we all are looking at things through the lens of our own experience. And what we care about is ourselves. So instead of highlighting your company, Highlight your client, highlight all the work that they're doing. And then you talk about yourself and how there's an intersection between their need or their problem and how you can solve it. That will create an incredibly different experience that is going to be much more fruitful, help you to get to the point and move forward in a way that's going to make them ask more questions and want to listen more. So let's talk about another one here too that happens a lot where we've got, well, first thing, invite them into action and do it in a way that's direct. So too often what we ends up happening, you know this, at the end of meetings, the end of a conversation, we rarely end with action of who's going to do what next. And so you're going to be a much more influential leader when you say, okay, so based on the conversation today that we've had, Here's what I plan to do, you know, so-and-so here, is this your next step? Like you can collaborate or if you're the boss, well, even if you're the boss, I think it's good to collaborate and ask people, okay, so based on the conversation we had in the meeting, here's what each of us is going to do next. Now, here's how to do it when you're giving a pitch to somebody or it's a message of influence at work. What you want to be careful of is saying things like, If you're interested, let me know. You want to be direct in this case. Would you like to learn more? Are you interested? Now, I have found that for most people, this is not a conscious thing. I have coached many sales teams and I record them doing these pitches one-to-one. And I tell them at the very end, you've got to ask a question that creates an action step that they can respond to. The majority of those recordings, well, before, so we record, then everybody sits down, and then I say, how many of you feel that you made a direct ask? 80% of the people raise their hands. Yes, absolutely. And then we watch them back, and the proof is in the pudding of the recording. It's amazing how few people made direct asks. It was very much these soft asks, like, if you'd like to learn more, if you're interested, And I think a lot of that comes from the fear of rejection. We don't want to ask that question directly, but that will help us so much when we ask that question and we get a response, yes or no, or perhaps maybe is another response. But that is the best way for you to get an immediate response because you've got to give them something direct to respond to. The last thing that I'll say today is about avoiding the pleasantries when you start a meeting or a conversation or a presentation. I'd say it's probably more related to a more formal situation, but be careful about what we like to call the lovely bunch of words up front where there's too many pleasantries. Thank you so much for coming. I'm so glad you're all here. How's the weather? How are you all doing? Now, I understand if you're being introduced by somebody and you want to say thank you. But stop there. Be careful about getting into all of these other things that are just taking you away from the point. And your audience will probably tune out. Now, the thing is, we are socially conditioned to be uh, doing those things up front. We're socially conditioned as we're even listening to people speaking. 
We're socially conditioned to those pleasantries, which is also why if you start with a data point, a story, or an example, and you jump right in to your presentation, then you are going to come across as different. You're going to stand out in a positive way. You're going to stand out in a way that people go, wow, that was a powerful presentation. That was a powerful meeting because you were direct, you got to the point, and you didn't mince words. So the other thing I want to say, though, before we wrap up here today, I want you to hear me when I say that this does not mean you just stand up and say, hi, I'm Karen. Thank you. My point is this. You <laughs> it depends on the situation. You've always got to know the situation, but just be careful about starting a talk and getting too much in the weeds with all of these pleasantries such that your point then gets missed. And as you're practicing for a more formal talk, time yourself and watch it back. Time yourself and record yourself and watch it back and ask yourself, how long did it take me to get to the point? Did I get to it? Typically, I would say within 30 seconds, unless you have an amazing story that only takes you, that will take you about a minute to share. Because if you've got a great story and people are drawn in, then they will be more likely to be with you so that by the time that story is done, you've got your point. But I would still caution you from anything over a minute before you get to the point. And if you do that, that's going to help you come across with more clarity, with more credibility and more authority. And again, I want to remind you that every month at this stage in the game, I am hosting a free call for women leaders. And that is coming up in September, at the end of September. There's going to be a link for it here at the bottom in the show notes. So I would love to have you there if you're interested in coming to an amazing group of other women leaders who are simply having an organic discussion about what gets in the way of asking for what we want. And as always, I've got a book that's out called Trust Your Own Voice, and that is a guidebook specifically on helping you grow your influence through confident communication skills. And until next time, have a very focused day. If you love today's episode, please subscribe and leave a review. It helps other people find the podcast faster, and it certainly helps me. Remember, you too can stand out with unshakable confidence.